Welcome to the session on how Flux is bootstrapping and verifying off-chain data on a brand new layer one. Um, my name is Jasper and I'm the CTO and co-founder of Flux. Um, Flux is an open mo market protocol built on top of NIR. Uh, we have a JavaScript SDK available where you can uh, interact and create markets, uh, interact with and create markets uh, within three lines of code, uh, markets on any asset or event. Um, without the need for any third-party uh, third wallet apps or plugins. While building a protocol like Flux, there are a lot of problems that you need to be solving. And uh, I kind of wanted to gloss over some of, the pro uh, some of the problems that we run into and then scope in on the ones that we think uh, to be very important. So the first sort of category of problems that we ran into while working on a product like Flux um, I'd like to call the legacy or the web, web two problems, which are market mechanics, order matching and liquidity management. And basically what you can think of this is like, are we gonna build in an automated market maker, uh, market making APIs? Uh, what are the order books gonna look like? So in short, it's basically how its value is stored and passes uh, it through a Flux protocol. Um, these problems are super interesting, but there is a lot of referential material that you can point at while working on these solutions. Uh, they've been solved plenty of times in plenty of ways, so uh, I don't want to talk about these uh, problems or solutions too much today. The second type of problem that you run into is the, as I like to call it, the uh, novel or Web3 problems. And then for us as, at Flux, the most sort of important problem that we're running into and what we've been thinking about a lot as of late is the Oracle problem. Um, and basically what the Oracle problem is, is how to get data from the real, real world on a blockchain or uh, even more specifically on Flux protocol. Um, and how to make sure that it's actually verified and it, it's actually true. Um, so basically uh, what Flux is, is you have all these markets around any asset or event. And at the end of the market, you need the answer to the question of the market uh, in order to be able to distribute the funds fairly to the users, uh, people that traded and had uh, interacted with the market itself. And uh, yeah, so, so that's like a super difficult problem. Um, the second problem is that there's monetary value everywhere, especially in a protocol like Flux, which is a DeFi protocol that is sort of designed around uh, containing lots of monetary value and uh, lots of monetary value going in and out there is lots of money to be made for uh, malicious actors through either exploits or hacks. Um, and actually what you'll see is that in most of these DeFi problems, the Oracle is sort of the gatekeeper protecting all of this monetary value. So actually, if you take a step back, these aren't really problems that are unique to Web3. Web2 faced these problems as well in the beginning, uh, but these solutions that work for Web2 are actually unfavorable for Web3 because they often involve regulation and centralized responsibility. Um, this could be, yeah, like I said, it's unfavorable to sort of the ethos of the Web3 community, but it's also um, sometimes sort of impossible on the layer one due to uh, pseudonymity and in the future anonymity due to private transactions. Um, I'd actually argue that it's also um, unnecessary if you have the right economic designs in place. Hey, Dimitri and uh, Sasha. Um, yeah. So basically, like the almost cliche term by now is how to go from can't be evil or how to go from don't be evil to can't be evil, how to go from people that have to be controlled by centralized authorities through regulation and uh, legislation um, to be able to unable to even do the acts that uh, are unwanted. Yep. So like I said, you have these decentralized oracles that are um, protecting all of this monetary value and all of these DeFi protocols. But if you zoom out a little bit, what you'll notice is that more often than not, there's actually a foundation or some sort of centralized party that has uh, some sort of influence on the decentralized oracle um, that could still be exploited um, in many ways. And we as Flux are not claiming that we're building the most decentralized Oracle like off the bat, but at least we want to be transparent and share our thinking on 
how we're going to get there over the next few months uh, to, to a year. This gets us to the next point is how will Flux process, pr progressively decentralize their market resolution um, while being able to actually get to market and prove out our product, which I think is something that's missing in a lot of the decentralized uh, protocols that we're seeing today is a lot of protocols go to market without actually uh, being sort of validated by the market. So before we get into this, like, what does a market look like? What does the lifespan of a market look like? Uh, it starts off with the creation. Um, then comes the resolution of the market. So what was the outcome of the market? Then there's an optional dispute during a dispute window. And in the end, there's finality. Uh, when the finality is reached, it's irreversible. Uh, the outcome that was uh, provided at finality was the final outcome of the market. And the funds can be distributed and claimed by users after market finality. Um, during the market creation, the market creator has to post a validity bond. The validity bond is sort of a stake that um, the market he creates is actually resolvable by, uh, so there is actually a correct answer to the market with the parameters uh, passed in. Uh, if the market resolves to an outcome that is not invalid, um, so if it, if it resolves to a valid outcome, basically the market creator gets his bond back and else the bond is slashed and distributed to the resoluters. Uh, then there's a resolution bond. So to the person that uh, provides the initial resolution to a market outcome, uh, this person also has to stake a little bit of money on whether uh, which outcome he thinks is the right outcome. And this way he also has a incentive to tell the truth. Then if in the case that this person didn't tell the truth or somebody uh, disagrees with his outcome, somebody has the opportunity within a dispute window to um, post a dispute bond, which is uh, right now double the resolution bond. And um, if he doesn't, if there's no dispute, uh, the market gets uh, finalized and reaches the state of finality. Uh, we're going to be focusing on the last three points. The creation is not very interesting for this topic. So how we did this in the past, so Flux Protocol has a testnet version live, which is super scaled back, basically just to test the market mechanics. Um, we have a valueless, non-transferable currency we call FDAI or fake DAI. It's denominated in dollars in the front end, and all markets are resolved by the market creator or protocol owner. So there is no economic guarantee anywhere built in that uh, the market resolution is actually the right uh, resolution. There's no fallback options. Um, but it doesn't really matter because there's no economic value being stored either. Uh, phase 0 0.2 is where we're at today. Um, so we changed it so that anybody can actually resolve a market now uh, by posting a resolution bond, which is now hard coded to 5 FDI. Anybody can post a dispute bond to stake, an, uh, stake on an outcome within the dispute window. So within 30 minutes after the initial resolution is uh, provided, anybody can dispute it by doubling the stake of the uh, resolution bond um, and get it into the dispute round. So both the dispute and the resolution bond can be crowdfunded, which is an important side note. It doesn't have to be one person to put up the entire bond um, because that would force it to be sort of sensitive to manipulation through wills or um, yeah, somebody has to build third party sort of uh, almost a DPoS type um, system. So participants earn money of obviously relative to the amount of participation or stake in the uh, their dispute rounds. And um, actually what we build in for now is that in this version of the protocol, there's only one dispute round. Um, and if the outcome is disputed in this case, then the final case, the case goes to a judge, uh, which is hard coded to be the protocol owner and the judge has final say on the outcome. So here I have a little model that goes over this. So Alice can create a market right now for free because there's no monetary value yet. Then Bob can stake a little bit of money on a resolution. Anybody can come in and dispute it. If it is disputed, then it goes to a judge who has the final outcome. And uh, if it's not disputed, then it reaches finality. I'm just going to see if there are any questions. Nope. So phase 0.3 is very similar to phase 0 .1, uh, 0 0.2, but there's actually real die ported over to NIR, either through a one-way escrow or through the NIR to Ethereum bridge. Um, 
we're heavily leaning towards the latter. Uh, it should be finished in time to be able to implement uh, it through the Ethereum bridge, and this way we have a two-way bridge that's trustless. Um, basically, what we'll do is we'll port over a small amount of DAI, distribute it amongst active uh, participants on Flux protocol, and uh, this way we can test our dispute resolution mechanisms when there's some monetary value involved. And uh, yeah, uh, from this point on, market creation will no longer be free, but there will be a validity bond added in as well. Um, yeah, so stay tuned for that. Uh, we'll be definitely posting an update on Twitter once we have DAI ported over. So uh, yeah, get excited. Um, so for phase 0 0.5, we're actually uh, maxing the amount of dispute. Uh, the we're upping the maximum amount of dispute rounds in the escalation game up to five rounds. Um, this way, we all get the judge hopefully less involved, and we'll make it more a little bit more decentralized. Um, so the initial dispute window will still probably be hard coded for thirty uh, minutes, as long as our sort of um, thesis on the thirty minutes uh, kind of proves out. It depends, it depends on how it goes in uh, the phases up to up to here. Um, and after that initial dispute window, each uh, dispute window will be twenty four hours long. Uh, we'll also be starting out a uh, yeah, we'll scale up sort of the experimentation with automated market resolvers for markets uh, that have categories that have high data availability, so like uh, sports markets, politics, etc. Um, we could either do this through third-party oracles, uh, oracles or natively, and the goal here is to speed up the initial resolution so that the, if there is a dispute, it can be sort of kicked off faster and um, this way we have a, uh, yeah, we basically just want to speed up the entire process from uh, placing your, or creating the market to market resolution. Um, and then for third party oracles, you can think of a chain link or we could build native solution, custom solutions through uh, either through Flux itself or our relayers. Uh, yeah, so even for these automated market resolvers, they don't have like a, any special powers. They'll still be disputable if they don't provide failed data, et cetera. So here's a little model on lining that out. Basically, the same thing, except that Alice has to now po pro, uh, post a creation bond, and the dispute round has an upper bound of five rounds before it goes to the judge. Yep. So for the next phase, we want to hit phase 1.0, uh, but we kind of hit a fork in the road. Um, there's sort of two options that we could go with, even though these options do have a common uh, denominator of constant sort of, uh, yeah, a, a common denominator, which are these next points. So with phase one, we'll introduce a Flux token, which is used to stake on outcomes, dispute outcomes, and govern the future of Flux protocol. The previously hard-coded dispute window will uh, no longer be hard-coded, but be arranged between 30 minutes to 24 hours, depending on open interest in the market. Um, the lower bound here, the 30 minutes, is actually adjustable by the market creator. If you create a market that ends at an obscure time for the people that probably will be participating in the market and you're afraid that 30 minutes won't be short enough if there is enough liquidity, then you can um, sort of up the lower bound to whatever you want. Yeah, so the resolution bond that needs to be provided to resolve the market also um, scales up with open interest in the market due to a fixed percentage of uh, that, that the person has to pay um, to, to uh, or stake to Resolute the market. And then the dispute escalation game will have a percentage of flux tokens total supply. Um, and when, when that threshold, which varies per uh, option, is hit, then we have two options. Option one is the universe fork, which we see in uh, protocols like UMA and Augur. Um, which is an extremely disruptive event, and we should design the economics for this event to hopefully never, or in like the worst case, very rarely happen. Basically, what this event causes is for the entire protocol, at least, yeah, the first, yeah, so for the entire protocol context for that time, um, to freeze market creation and finalization, 
and force all of the stakeholders to uh, transfer the tokens to one of the outcomes. Um, so for each, out, each possible outcome of the market, there's a universe created, a new universe created, and everybody has to pick a universe that they transfer their tokens to. Uh, the universe with most tokens uh, transferred to it uh, wins the market, and the market wrestles to that. And um, all markets are all all tokens are stuck in each universe that they transfer to. So they are uh, the universe is silo away from each other, and they're sort of infinitely different possibilities of uh, numbers of uh, protocols out there. It's it's pretty abstract, especially the first time you hear it. It's also pretty genius, but uh, super disruptive. So yeah. Um, option two would be to create some sort of a court. This is actually more similar to the previous solution that we had with the judge being the sort of last say in the uh, outcome of a market, um, except for the fact that anybody can become a judge by staking a high percentage or a high amount of flux tokens uh, to mint what I like to call a gavel bond. And uh, judges are able to have final say in the market outcome and earn a certain percentage of total flux tokens staked uh, on the wrong outcomes. Um, judges will have the right incentives because if they provide the market with the wrong answer, their gavel bonds will lower in volume because they're uh, because the value of the protocol will drop if the uh, resolutions aren't correct. And then there's a bunch of different uh, restrictions you can lay on there uh, for the for the Gobble bond, uh, gabble bond minting. And, and the nice thing about this is that you can set a lower threshold to get to this case of um, disputes uh, because it's way less disruptive to the protocol itself. All other markets continue as normal. So if you'd kind of have the pros and cons, you'd have the pros of the fork would be that it has stronger economic guarantees and is like tested right now in similar context to Flux. Uh, the con is that it's extremely disruptive. You basically pause everything for uh, in our protocol right now it's 30 days uh, the pro about a court is that it's way less disruptive um, since the decision process will be much quicker and all the markets can just continue as business as usual um, but the cons is that it's less economic guarantee and it hasn't been proven out at all yet uh, at least within this exact context so right now we're actually heavily memeing towards the fork um, we feel like the economic guarantees are strong and it's a super cool concept, but we are very, very happy to consider the court more and we're actively thinking about it. Um, but yeah, yeah, leading towards the fork. Thank you for your time. Uh, that was it. That was actually a little bit faster than, uh, that was actually a little bit faster than I was thinking beforehand. Cool. So I see a question from Fan Katha. I said heavily memeing, but I it kind of is the meme. So I meant heavily leaning, basically, Deborah. Yeah. So Peter gave a pretty concrete answer there. Um, we're focusing on the infrastructure. Uh, people building on top can choose to either be regulated or um, or go with an approach where they say like, hey, we're non-custodial front end and, um, and and yeah, we don't really have any control over what our users exactly do, um, which is a popular stance with some of the uh, relayers on decentralized systems. Yeah, if anybody wants to join the panel to ask questions, that's okay with me. Um, if anybody has any questions they wanna type, that's okay with me too. We have plenty of time left. So we did an audit on Augur, which I believe came to the conclusion that about 7% of each market entered a dispute phase, but it has a very big but uh, with one T. And that is that um, there, uh, uh, Augur had to develop market bug. So uh, basically there was a lot of incentive to create invalid or sort of, um, debatable markets in order for them to be resoluted to invalid. So there were a ton of the ton of the um, 
disputes were surrounding those markets. So it's pretty hard to say. But if and it also depends on how sort of tight you bound you bind the economic incentive. If it's like super expensive to dispute a market, um, then probably disputes are going to be low. But then the chances of uh, a dis an invalid or like an invalid outcome slipping through is also higher. So you have to kind of trade off um, usability for security here. And this is what we're doing right now, right? I mean, none of these things I said are set in stone. They're all up for change. Um, do you mean if we are if we should could be used by Uma or if we are like similar to Uma? Is that is that your question, Antoine? Antoine? Um, I actually talked to Hart from Uma about this, and we think that we're pretty different since they are they don't require full collateralization, and we are more similar to uh, I'd say prediction market in that there's always the both parties are always have to be fully collateralized. Um, so I'm going to go with no, but this type of system is actually something that UMA is also actively thinking about, or Yume is also actively thinking about uh, for their uh, disputes. Um, Mike, regarding fun use cases, we really want, so what I'm most excited about actually is I want to have a Twitter bot that just allows me to create skin in the game markets on anybody that has a, has a big mouth about wanting to place a bet on something. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's like, it, it, you, I see it more and more people that like want to have some skin in the game on Twitter arguments. Uh, Antoine. Yes. So yeah, we are a protocol that is built on top of near protocol. Yep. Other than that, Mike, um, there is a bunch. I would like to see. So yeah, okay. So there's this 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 one project called um, ID Markets, and they want to use Flux to sort of bet on the legitimacy of news outlets, which I think is also super cool. And that way, you can sort of rank them. Uh, so they have their own ranking system, and then you can sort of. Uh, yeah, so Erasure Bay is actually very, very different, I'd say. Where Erasure Bay, there's one person asking one question, and then anybody can sort of answer it. Um, and if the creator then sort of agrees that that the question is answered or if like the court uh, agrees that the question is answered then uh funds are uh, released from escrow i'd say that this is more similar it's, it's sort of like if you would uh have a razor bay and place a decentralized exchange around it basically where anybody can trade on the outcome without actually having to reveal the outcome until an event has happened also ration ration bay can be Questions can remain unanswered, where on Flux, every question needs to have an answer. Does that make sense? I, I'm not up to the latest of Erasure Bay, to be honest. I, I know it's sort of like the big picture. Um, yeah, so we categorized two different ways of answering a question. A question could be answered in, uh, I can get super nerdy or I can si simplify it a little bit. Okay, so, okay, no, I'm gonna simplify it. It could be either automated or it could be um, manual. So, so there's two types of markets. There would be a market on whether, um, whether the Knicks are gonna win their next game, which there's plenty of data on the internet that could be pooled to resolute that market correctly. Um, so what you could do is at market during market creation, you can provide, provide an API, uh, with your question. And then, uh, there can be surfaces that then, uh, format, reformat this API data and automatically resolute your market. So this way your market is basically answered by the internet or an API call. Another way uh, that it could be done is manually where you have an actual person reading the question after it happened going online, Googling it, or like doing some research 
if it's a more obscure question that doesn't necessarily have an API attached to it or like a bunch of private data or private APIs, uh, this person can then access that data and uh, manually enter the outcome of the market and stake on it. Um, so those are the two ways and the question can get answered. And then the whole dispute resolution progress process that we just went over is sort of more of a way to verify uh, that this data was in fact correct than, um, than providing the actual initial data. So subjective markets would probably resolute to, um, uh, so, 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 yeah, subjective markets would probably resolute to invalid. Um, if it also markets that aren't verifiable by a large majority might also resolute to invalid if they're interesting enough or if there's enough money at stake, I'd say. Um, yeah, so it, it's 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 either automated through APIs or it's wisdom of the crowds. That that's sort of the those are the those are the two ways of uh, resoluting a market. Yeah, so we recently debuted. Yo, <laughs> so yeah, we recently uh, debuted the first market connecting with esports games. It was actually me playing a game of TFT, and what we do is we would uh, scan or like keep calling the uh, TFT API, see if I was in a game. If I was in a game, we would check my uh, wins and losses beforehand, uh, create a market market make it according to my uh, win-loss ratio. And then uh, at the end of the game, after it's finished, after an hour, I don't know, no, it was like hard-coded to one hour after the market was created, we would then again check the API whether my uh, wins and losses, wins or losses increased by one. Uh, in case that my wins increased by one, the market was resolute to yes, I won. In case the uh, losses increased by one, uh, the market was uh, resolute to no, I lost. And if the number didn't change, the market would resolute to invalid because apparently I didn't play a game. Uh, yeah, I can send a... Peter, can you... Yep, thank you very much, Peter. Um, FW few. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to say that what's God's name? It would be super interesting to see those types of market. Um, but I would probably say that that's more something for Erasure Bay. I would say that, that that's actually a perfect erasure bay uh, question than a flux market question since it's super subjective. Um, Chris, hey, great to see you, man. Um, yeah, so I'm super excited about esports, especially now in these times. I think it's super interesting. Um, I think that the predictive, awesome. Yeah, so I, I think that I think that the predictive as markets are sort of philo philosophically the most interesting. So um, if you think about politics is interesting, but also scandals and obviously like I'm still biased for people that don't know, we used to work on a protocol, uh, a, a product on top of Augur and we were building derivatives on startups. So basically startup futures and something like that, I'd also really, really like to see. So basically betting on startup valuations, um, whether they go out of business, uh, yeah, that those are super interesting. So esports, startups, uh, viral markets. So if you look at the um, if you look at the uh, Corona markets that we've had so far, even with fake money, they were actually super accurate in predicting. Um, we predicted a bunch of things. Peter, can you find the? Yeah, yeah, we work. Uh, will we work be used to store oil by the end of twenty twenty? Um, so Peter, could you maybe find the? the sort of tweets that you sent to uh, Paul G from uh, our, our Corona cases, our, our Corona markets, because those those were actually pretty impressive. Even for the for the stage that we're in right now, those predictions were super accurate. So that's that's exciting. So I, I would categorize those under viral. So vi viral news cycles, esports, and then startups. It's probably sort of my top three most interesting markets, but I'm very open to suggestions. Cross-market liquidity. So you mean how liquidity is shared between markets? Is that, is that what you're asking? Or how liquidity will differ between markets? Due to um, collateral, that's a hard word. Due to collateralization, um, 
issues like like these markets have to be fully collateralized if i place a bet for 50 dollars at 50 50 percent odds um the other person also has to place a bet of 50 dollars at 50 percent odds as well otherwise there is no market yeah so we could use compound but we would use compound in a different way where we would be a liquidity provider for compounds where all of the assets stored on flux are temporarily landed out and collect interest um, I, I, I cross, you can't really share uh, liquidity uh, across markets. Yeah, you, you can't really share liquidity across markets because of the collateralization. We are looking into implementing an automated market maker, which Dimitri Berenson, who should also be here, or at least he was, um, is helping us with. Um, he's basically an expert by now. Once again, this is sort of my crazy opinion, but I think that insiders betting on uh, markets without KYC is actually sort of the goal of prediction markets in general, where private data is uncovered uh, through insiders being able to trade on things they know. So this is how predictions work. It's also um, for, for some markets, like the eSport markets, for example, um, this is less interesting because the predictions don't really matter as much, especially for short term markets. I'd say that if there's insider trading there, it's probably on the front ends to. Um, uh, if it's a problem, then the front end should start KYCing their user before uh, before letting them interact with Flux, because I don't think I, I know that uh, KYC at protocol level in smart contract systems is, is no solution. It's actually impossible. Unless, unless actually you have a centralized authority that would uh, approve or deny uh, accounts me made, but yeah. Uh, right now, there is no hard-coded asset. Um, we'll probably have best practices around it being either DAI or some other stablecoin. We prefer DAI for now since it's sort of the best thing out there, but uh, there's a lot of new things coming out. Um, but yeah, sta definitely stable, stable assets, I'd say. It's actually pretty interesting to have unstable assets for specific markets. There's sort of two playbooks that could be played out. I'd say that my vision for the next two to three years is that Flux will become the uh, Google for events that haven't happened yet. So if you want to know um, the sort of odds of something happening or if something's going to happen, you can like type in the question on Google, uh, go to a flux market and see sort of the likelihood of the event actually happening. So basically using the predictive nature of, of these markets to forecast the future. And then another way that's actually super cool, which is I touched upon earlier, is that it only takes three lines of code to implement this into any product. So it being used as sort of the skin in the game um, the stripe for markets, the uh, skin in the game markets is, is sort of like a short term sort of way to spin it. But the, but the prediction sort of uh, predictive uh, possibilities is what's way more interesting to me from a sort of uh, mission vision standpoint. So, okay. So, so, okay. So this is actually super important. Uh, good, good point. I, that might've been confusing. Um, you cannot bet Bitcoin against DAI. If you create a market, you have to select an asset that the market will trade in, which is also the reason why we probably want to be pretty strict on which asset you can actually use, because you don't want your liquidity to be split up amongst all types of different markets without there being like a super good uh, liquidity aggregator, like an one inch on near, for example, that you can quickly... Uh, quickly divide your assets or change your assets in. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I would love to have somebody on here. Yeah, 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 Kanan, yeah, I was, uh, Kanan. I was actually thinking about that as we were speaking about it. You could do that. Mm -hmm. But then but then you get into liquidation issues, bank run issues, uh, under collateralization issues. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, we we will have a token. We don't yet. Um, 
the token will be used and is designed to scale up with the open interest in the markets. So the more open interest is in our markets, uh, the more value is locked in our markets, the more the token has to increase in value to keep the protocol secure. So that's sort of the first mechanism. Um, the second mechanism that we've been playing around with, but we really have to also start testing out and probably have to have some sort of liquidity lock, uh, <laughs> have some sort of liquidity lock on there is to put the stable assets or the stable coins into a uh, compound like protocol. Um, and that way you can sort of make, uh, collect interest on the money locked on the protocol and distribute it to the token holder. So that's another way to sort of stabilize the, um, or peg the token price to the open interest in the market, because the more open interest there is in markets, uh, the more, uh, APR is being made. Hi, Jasper. Hey. I'm going to join because I actually have some questions. Um, cool. Okay. Yeah. So I know you've been building on top of Nier. What has that been like for you? Um, so actually, building on top of Nier has been really nice. Um, we've been, I think, with uh, Kanan right now, we're probably next to Kanan, we're probably the next, uh, the, the longest. We've been building on Nier for the longest time now which I think we're almost approaching like three quarters or something of a year. Um, what we've been, what we've really enjoyed is sort of the direct feedback loop with the devs that we've had. So if we have uh, feature requests, they're usually implemented really quickly. Uh, the dev tools, uh, even as soon as I actually started programming or building smart contracts were already pretty much up to par with what Ethereum had, if not better. And they've only gotten better and better over time. I like the fact that Rust gives you way more flexibility, which is almost weird to say, but it's it's way more flexible than what you can do with Solidity. Like you, the uh, possibilities are way greater. Greater. Um, obviously, we'll have to see what the fees and stuff will be looking like into the future. But so far, that has been very promising. Speed is good. Um, uptime uptime used to be a little bit of a problem, but I've actually not have at I haven't had any issues with that for a while now. Um, the fact that how accounts work is also fantastic. So the way how people can sign in with an account. Uh, the only thing I'm worried about for now is uh, how to make sure that your uh, front ends don't have too much power as soon as you sign in. So I guess my next question is then, so I missed the beginning of the talk, so do forgive me. But if you're bootstrapping and validating off-chain data, that means you're taking data off of near and validating it. Is that correct? So, uh, yeah, so I, I get that the title was a little bit, description was a little bit uh, confusing maybe. No, it's about getting data from the real world or the internet world onto here. Oh, okay. Well, and validating it, making sure that it's correct. And so you get to a prediction market and, and Kanan wants to know what your plans are for the upcoming presidential election. And I'm also curious. Yeah, so, I mean, that's going to be very exciting. We really hope that we have a little bit more security around our protocol by, by then and um, some the possibility for real monetary value to be uh, added onto it through either DAI or whatever so that we can fully utilize this presidential election. Um, we actually know a lot of people that are super interested in trading on the presidential uh, election. They're pretty large big time players on uh, sort of the centralized prediction markets. So yeah, we, we wanna we wanna serve them basically so yeah that would be great but yeah we are not going to build a presidential election banning app or something i think um we'll, but we'll definitely find somebody to to do that cool all right those are all my questions i'm gonna hop off thank you for answering awesome. great questions yeah so i mean right now yeah outside of the elections yeah i'm not much of a uh i, have, I don't have enough time to get too involved in politics uh, and especially the Dutch elections aren't as interesting or the German elections aren't as interesting as the American ones. Um, yeah, so other events we're excited to serve once again, like the esports stuff, but that's getting old now. Um, I, I still really like the Corona uh, markets, which isn't really, as, yeah, it's also an event, but uh, like the, the prediction data around that is super interesting. Um, Sports events are interesting. Um, actually, we predict our uh, protocol predicted that the Tokyo Olympics would be canceled, like back in what was it, early March or February. So that that was also super interesting. So that's an event 
that we actually predicted wouldn't happen. Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, not much of an event guy, more of a problem solve guy, I'd say. Um, yeah, so I'd say that so far without any, so the wisdom of the crowds, <laughs> yeah. No, so the, so the wisdom of the crowd sort of philosophy is that as long as you don't put any financial um, value behind your prediction, um, the accuracy is often much lower. So, and also you would attract way less people to trade on your markets if there's no financial um, incentive. Um, so, but from the data that we have collected so far, um, the, the Corona data is super interesting. I don't know if Peter is still here, if he is, if he found the Twitter th uh, thread that has our um, like markets around Corona and the odds there. Cool, yeah. Peter, can you find the, uh, yeah, awesome. Uh, Mork, Mork will try. I'm sorry, I'm bad with pronunciations. Yes. Yes. That. Yeah, you could easily spread bad. Yes, no markets. Yeah, I figured. <laughs> Nobody's named Mork Mork will try, buddy. Um, um, so initial liquidity. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, so. Cool, thanks, Peter. Um, so this is actually why we were th also one of the big points of thinking about creating a market maker because right now you sort of assume that the initial market maker or the market creator will also create uh, make the market to odds that like have a favorable spread for him or at least he knows somebody or like knows people that would be interested in market making or that he has odds in mind. Um, but yeah, price discovery is actually what we're talking about here. Kanan, probably it might take a little bit of time, but in if there's like one dollar on either side, nobody has to take that bet. Anybody can place a limit order at a price that they uh, deem best. Does that make sense? Yep, could be zero matches, twenty million in liquidity, but not very likely. Um, let's see. The limit refers to a probability of hitting. One dollar. Uh, yeah, it's so it's a probability in cents relative to the one dollar. So if some if the odds are fifty percent, then the price is fifty cents. Um, if you don't agree with those odds, you can place an order at a lower cent amount. Uh, yeah, yeah, and yeah, it's between zero and one hundred cents. Between zero and one dollar. Hey, can you hear me? Hey, yeah. I'm just I'm good for my presentation. How's it going? Um, quick question. So you said limit order. Let's say I want to buy a thousand shares at a price of 80 cents. And the price right now is 75 cents. And then it goes to 85, you know, 80 cents and my order starts fulfilling. Mm -hmm. um, I'm assuming that you know, my shares would get invested all at that price, meaning, yep. um, yep. so, no. so it could, it could go up to my price. I buy one share, it go back down It come back up, could buy one more share, go back down. So there mm -hmm. would have to be sufficient liquidity on the other side of the order book to, you know, scrape exactly. out my whole, my exactly. whole. Yeah. And that's where the whole, uh, full collateralization comes in. And also sort of the biggest issue with prediction markets in general. Um, so this is actually super interesting. So the way this order book works is super interesting for professional market makers that have a very exact, uh, spread that they want to make on the market. So they have a super precise idea of what the odds are of something happening and they know exactly what spread they want to make. So then it's very interesting to provide liquidity for markets like these, um, for the more niche obscure markets. Um, I'd say that an automated market maker makes more sense like LMRS, uh, which basically, uh, has an aggression multiplier that sort of depending on the liquidity in each of the outcomes um, at which price sort of uh, multiplies by a certain amount of liquidity to so make sure that there's always an order available. And But yeah, that can get really jumpy um, and it needs to be done right and it needs one person to provide upfront liquidity. So it, it's interesting, but it's, um, it's more for the niche markets, I'd say. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna be back.
yeah, cool. I'll see you at your talk for sure. Um, so, um, Mork, yeah, so basically, price discovery happens through, so somebody has to place a limit order, basically, um, at odds that they think reasonable. And um, this will sort of, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Can you can you sort of phrase uh, what part is, uh, what part are you not, uh, don't you understand right now? Then I can sort of zoom in on that. So uh, one thing to note is that the price has to be between um, one cent and 99 cent. And I can actually create, I'm going to, I'm going to create a market, um, live, and then we can see how the order books behave. Does that, that does make sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's create a market. Will I be able to explain our order books category is, um, miscellaneous info. There's either yes or no. And we'll end it. Yeah. Right. So the way you can spread that here is if you know the, so basically you can either buy yes or no in this market, right? So if we say that I know I have insider info here, so I know that I will be totally able to explain you how our order books work and how this could be like used for spread betting. Um, so I buy a yes, I'm pretty convinced. So I'll purchase it for 95 uh, cents, which is 95% uh, odds basically. And I'll put in $95. Boom. Now, what we can do here, you can see that since we pr uh, placed one bet for 95 cents here, the odds or the price of the no share has uh, become five, but we don't agree with that, those odds. Um, <laughs> we actually want to um, have a spread there. So what we'll do here is we'll say, we'll market make this one for $1. So now the price of this one, uh, the yes, the share, yes share is now set to 99 cents, which means that there's like a four cent spread here in which if somebody buys, uh, yeah, there's like a four cent spread. So if anybody buys any of these two outcomes, we know that we have some, um, some, um, uh, we have some sort of advantage over them. That, that's what I wanted to say. And you could, but you can do that with, Right. Yeah. So I guess the best thing to say is probably that the, the pr assets price here is actually the probability. So you're basically saying if, if the price is a range between uh, zero and 100 or like one and 99, basically, then um, it's basically saying like between one and 99% chance that it will happen or not. Does that make sense? I, I think we're also talking past each other a little bit. I'm not uh, very familiar with spread betting. Cool, awesome. Okay, great. Well, that was my time. Um, I actually have to look at the uh, start. If you guys want to talk more, actually, go to the Stardust panel right now. I'll be in there as well, and Peter will be as well. Um, so we can we can keep discussing this. It will be talking about flux as well. Any everybody, thank you so much for your questions uh, and feedback. It was super helpful, and um, yeah, see you in our Discord hopefully. Ciao.